Welcome to this edition of the Week in Review. This week is ending, but not without political fisticuffs between the All Progressive Congress and the People's Democratic Party PDP, and even within the APC. Also, the security infrastructure within the state receives major boosts as Governor Obiano presents 35 new vehicles to different security agencies in the state. On Real Dimensions, we feature Mr. Uche Onyagocha as we discuss politics and the future of Imo State. I am David Obukwasele. Join us as we review the major events that happened in the week. I have taken some time to review and seek advice on the resolution. And what I found is that it contravenes both our party constitution and the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Furthermore, I think if we deviate from the constitutional provisions, we might be endangering the fortunes of our party. If the tenure of our party executives can be legally faulted, then it means that any nominations and primary elections that they may conduct can also be faulty. This is not talk of divisions that would arise and is already arising within the party. In this circumstance, what is expected of us is to conduct fresh elections once the tenure of the current executives approaches its end. A caretaker committee cannot remedy the situation and cannot validly act in place of elected officers. Fortunately, we have already approved a timetable for the holding of congresses and elections. I think this should be allowed to go forward and all efforts should now be geared toward making them a great success. For the often time, the government of Chu William Biano showed it has not relented in its fight to make the state the safest state in Nigeria. Alex Ekwemesku again this Friday hosted in the Anambra's governor Obiano distributed 35 trucks and promised that another 100 is on the way. Our man, Kenneth Kwofoma, was there and tells us now how it happened. Governor Biano has presented 35 four-wheel trucks to security agencies to boost the state security architecture. Among the agencies that got vehicles were the Nigerian Army, the Nigerian Navy, the Nigerian Police Force, and the Nigerian Security and Civil Defense Corps. Presenting the vehicles, Governor Biano said security remains top on his enabler list and revealed that another batch of 100 vehicles will soon be distributed. He enumerated some of the measures being taken by his administration to sustain the security in the state to include replacement of sand bags with CCTV cameras, combing of all uncompleted buildings and suspected hideouts, and strengthening of the vigilant outfits for better functioning among others. The governor noted that as a result of the existing Thai security in the state, a victim kidnapped two days ago has been rescued and criminals captured. While assuring the citizenry that he is not resting on his oars as regarding security, Governor Biano however sounded a note of warning to criminals to stay away from the state as there will be no mercy for them when apprehended. What you are seeing is only one of the physical infrastructures. There's so many things that you are not seeing that we are doing. So there's no hiding place for a criminal here in another state. As you are aware, we are gradually changing our standard areas to CCTV, modern technology, so that uh, we will be able to find out what happened even if we are not there when it happened, and be able to arrest the people. You will notice a lot of uh, uh, very decent, well-dressed gentlemen of the armed forces and police that you see on the roads doing their work. Please, when they stop you, politely stop. They are not going to harass you. They are not there to check your particulars. They are there to check um, to make sure that uh, first that you are safe and secondly that there's nothing hidden in your car that will make anybody in Anambra unsafe. 
Earlier, the State Commission of Police, Mr. Garba Omao, said the gesture is yet another indicator of Governor Obianon's security of lives and property and promised that the vehicles will be effectively deployed to achieve the objective for which government procured them. Today, whereby you will see, you have seen the humane nature and the passion of the governor in terms of security in the state. Members of the public and everyone that is here, I'm happy to say that globally, not here, globally, probably that is why uh, my excellency is called Apotheke Global. <laughs> because he has gone around, all his name has gone all over, that Anambra State is the seventh state, indeed, is the seventh state in Nigeria. In a vote of thanks, the Deputy Inspector General of Police representing the South East Zone, Mr. Valon Tomchuku, observed that Anambra is now the safest state in Nigeria because Governor Biano understands the place of security in ensuring the development of any society, calling on other governors of the Federation to emulate him. I will want to praise him for what he has been doing before, what he is doing today, and what he is planning to do in advance. In his remarks, the Abga Vice Chairman in charge of Anambra South Senatorial District, Chief Titus Anabogo, said the gesture by the governor sends a strong message that the state under the leadership of Governor Biano is a no-go area for criminals. Handover of the keys to the vehicles, as well as parade by men of number 54 Mumbai Squadron on Nisha, formed the high point of the event. It seems the new dawn for the Anambra Broadcasting Services are ending as it continues to register new achievements on a weekly basis. This week did not leave the establishment without registering another positive story as Governor William Biano donated two new buses to the organization. The story is next. Governor William Biano has presented brand new 14-seater buses to Anambra Broadcasting Service. The buses were presented to the management of the ABS on behalf of the governor by his deputy, Dr. Nkemo Keke, making the presentation at the governor's lodge, Amobia. Governor Biano said the gesture is consistent with his promise to transform ABS to meet international standards in broadcasting. He noted that in keeping with the promise, his government has built digital television and radio studios for the ABS and cleared backlog of pension and gratuity areas, while staff of the station are being trained to keep pace with new trends in the practice. The governor assured that his government will sustain the support to ABS until it attains the befitting status. These buses will help to enhance the uh, service delivery from the ABS to make ABS much, much better in service delivery, better in the southeast, better in the nation. I know the, uh, the governor has mentioned some stations that he wants them to be in the same rank, but I choose not to mention those stations. I think we know them, but hopefully these buses will add and make their job a lot easier for them to do a better job. Receiving the keys to the buses, the chairman of ABS Board of Directors, Dr. Emeka Madebuna, thanked the government for its interest in repositioning the outfit and expressed the hope that the vehicles will help enhance logistics in the station. This will go a long way towards enhancing the logistics of the work that we do. We'll make considerable remain very grateful and we are hopeful let me play only my twist that more we can <laughs> On his part, the Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of ABS, Nzeu Chengwara, said under his watch, the station is on course towards achieving the mandate assigned to it by the government and noted that the vehicles will help the station get to all nooks and crannies of the state. His Excellency cleared the backlog of outstanding pension and gratuity dating over 25 years. Uh, of course, ongoing you know, salaries are paid as and when the training is going on. So this is also fulfillment of the promise the Excellency has made you know, towards the uh, repositioning ABS for better service delivery. So we're very excited. Back at the ABS headquarters in Oka, the vehicles were received by members of staff and management with dancing and chants of solidarity for the governor. In Oka, I am Kene Chukuofoma, reporting for ABS News. 
The Nigerian police has announced it will no longer tolerate the unauthorized use of spy and covered number plates and sirens. The Commissioner of Police, Mr. Garbo Maher, in a press conference on Monday, had announced the move to, spot, to stop the anomaly. Ekwe Ajide retells the story. The Commissioner of Police warned that only authorized individuals and organizations on essential duties, such as the governor, banks, ambulance, fire service, among others, can use siren. He, however, cautioned that if such bodies use sirens indiscriminately, the police will catch and prosecute them appropriately. Mr. Omar stated that other than the authorized group, anyone caught violating such laws will be arrested and dealt with decisive. We therefore warn that on no account, nobody in the state and beyond should cover his plate number <coughs> or use serene if he's not entitled. The CP also disclosed that sequel to the recent directive of the Inspector General of Police on withdrawal of all police personnel attached to VIPs, government officials, political office holders, corporate organizations, multinational companies, the State Police Command is reminding the general public that the enforcement of the withdrawal will commence from the 20th of next month and called for all new applications for the services of police mobile men special protection unit, counter-terrorism squad, and conventional police to be processed and submitted to the Office of the Commissioner of, of Police, Anambra State Police Command Headquarters, OCA, who will forward all applications to the Inspector General of Police for approval. He, however, noted that it is only the Inspector General of Police that can grant such requests. The CP urged all unit commanders of various formations in the command to ensure strict compliance to the direct Directive in Oka Equi Ajide ABS News. Have you ever wondered what the experiences were for the thousands of Africans traded as slaves to the West? What could be going through their minds as they pass through the hallowing, inhumane, and excruciating pains of chains, whips, and being torn to something slightly above animals? I bet we could not imagine. Nevertheless, our correspondent, if we had the attempt to recapture this mold in this report as she visits Badagri and Calaba Museums. Many decades after the abolition of the tragic transatlantic slave trade in Nigeria, it has remained one of the darkest chapters in human history. A visit to the slave history museums in Badagri, Lagos State, and Calabar in Cross River State shows that history of slavery in Nigeria is still as horrifying as it was real. Millions of men, women, and children across all tribes in the country were victims of slavery that lasted for over a century with Badagri and Calabar, notorious for availing passages through which the slave masters took their human consignments via the Atlantic Ocean into countries of their masters. Though slave trade ended in 1886, the relics have remained till date. Our walk through these relics brings back the nostalgia of yesteryears that one begins to wonder how the victims felt then. What do you think of, of, of the slaves if they drink water, even with the chains around their necks? Unless that are uh, the stupid, or oh, oh, should I call it stupid water, that's the spirit attenuation water that they give to them that makes them to lose their memory. Instead of them giving them something that will energize them, they will now give them um, oh, just like a sham that makes them not to know what is happening again. Badagri was said to have 40 slave holding cells, otherwise called barracoons, where these slaves were kept in 40s until shipment. However, of the 40, two used to store artifacts are still in existence while the rest now serve residential purposes. With the size of the cells, one is wont to ask how did 40 slaves, as it was reported, squeeze in there? According to tour guides, Femi and Shakiru, slavery measured in trade by butter were items like mirror or bead, often dependent on the bargaining power of the buyer and seller, were exchanged for humans. We were told that such items as a bottle of gin went for 10 slaves, an umbrella for 40 slaves, while a big cannon gun went for 100 slaves. 
The slaves were reportedly gagged with lip locks to prevent them from talking or eating sugar cane while walking on plantations. Neck and ankle locks and branded using hot irons with the names of their masters while the weak and sick among them were thrown into the sea on transit. We were shown a well called the spirit attenuation well from which the slaves were made to drink substances that tamed them among other demeaning acts. The slaves, with their ankles bound in chains, were made to walk for 20 minutes from the lagoon to the point of no return. <laughs> These were cries of captured slaves being cautioned to accept their fate. This, when translated, means Stop crying. Where you are going is much better than where you are. A letter of apology said to have been written by relations of a notorious slave trader in Badagri at the time, Sariki Williams Abbas, who was taken into slavery at the age of six and later commissioned by his master to become a slave trader for the role of their ancestor in slave trade was clearly displayed at the museum. The unimaginable thing is that Badagri, which in history has the first story building, the first school, and the first church in Nigeria, has remained undeveloped till date. These citizens, including Chairman Badagri Local Government Council, Mr. Shegun, the National Vice President of Nigeria Rice Farmers Association, Mr. Sheguato, and the seller, Mr. Femi Martins, say is as a result of government's lack of interest in the tourism potentials of the community. When tourism come, we have a vision and we're ready to take care of our passenger okay. because of another time. If you look at Nigeria Badagri as a historical town, we see that the time all these things are happening, nobody thought that they will be good for development in future. We still appeal to the government to come to our aid to help develop Badagri. But the Lagos state government seems to have woken from its slumber as it is remodeling the slave tunnel. This is where Bill Gates is quietly spending more than $1.6 billion of his fortune. His money helping to eradicate the scourge of polio in Nigeria. But grinding poverty remains. And for many, an absence of political leadership. As a partner of Nigeria. So the once silent partner is speaking out. You know, I am saying that the current plan is inadequate. Directed squarely at politicians, the public rebuke is a rare departure for Gates and his foundation, but it comes at a critical time. Africa's biggest economy is heading into the 2019 elections with the continent's largest youth population. Nearly 8 million of them are unemployed. Why are you thinking that it's good to give hard facts to Nigerian leaders right now? Well, Nigeria um, has all these young people and <clears throat> the current uh, quality and quantity of investment in this young generation uh, the health and education just isn't good enough. Uh, and, you know, so I was very uh, direct. Gonna... Out on the streets, they say the government is often absent or present in the form of an official asking for a bribe. Nigeria is rated one of the most corrupt countries. So, you know, what do you think of the message that Bill Gates is bringing here? Bill Gates is saying the truth. Moses Achendu works in a bank near the market. He says vendors like this woman selling IFO don't have steady electricity and they can't access loans. All these people are trying to survive and are they being helped? No. People are struggling to survive every day. The government says it has welcomed Gates's message and is working to do better for the people, a population that by 2050 will be bigger than in the United States. Do you see the potential for Nigeria when you visit uh, people in this country and go out onto the streets? I really do think of all the countries I've seen, uh, it really hangs in the balance. If, if they can get health and education right, uh, they will be an engine of growth, not just for themselves, 
uh, which would be those 400 million people, but for all of Africa. Moses says Nigerians don't need to be given much to succeed. We are frustrated, yes. If they could just be provided with the basics, he says the talent of Nigerians will shine through. David McKenzie, CNN Lagos. As we look at the calendar for 2019, we will say that the year is still about nine months away. Far, right? Probably for you, but not longer for any politician out there. We visited our warriors Ucho Onya Agocha declares to run for Imo government house, making him the 19th aspirant to have already declared to contest for the Imo Guba race in the All Progressive Grand Alliance, Abga. A former member of the House of Representatives, Mr. Uche Onya Agocha, has declared his intention to run for the 2019 gubernatorial election in Imo State on the platform of the All Progressive Grand Alliance, ABGA. The Obin Zebom politician made his intention known in a World Press Conference held at the party's sectorate in Oweri, Imo State. The legal practitioner turned politician defected to ABGA last November and will be the 19th to officially declare on the platform of the party in Imo State, while addressing party stakeholders and members of the press, Mr. Onya Agocha promised that if elected, he will focus on revitalizing and providing more access to education and the welfare of the ordinary masses suffering in the state. Mr. Onya Agocha, a former special advisor to Imo State Governor Owele Rochas Okoloja, apologized for the roles he played for the emergence of the governor while promising to open up all the facts, figures, sufferings and abuses put on the people of Imo State. According to the Abgaguba aspirant, the policies of the Imo State government has caused untold hardship to the people of Imo State. He further urged the citizenry to actively participate in the ongoing continuous voter registration exercise to ensure free and fair elections in the state. We have seen Imo State brought into a state of hopelessness. People's properties have been destroyed in the name of so-called urban renewal without compensation. Civil servants have been paid less than their due salaries. Pensioners have been denied their emoluments. Markets have been destroyed at the peak of trading seasons. Displaced traders have fled to rural markets only to have their new stores in the rural area demolished. Artisans and KK operators have been impoverished. Therefore, I state unequivocally that the APC government at the center and the Nemo state has failed in Nemo and in Nemo generally, and something has to give. My name is Uche Onyagota, and I am presenting myself to this great party, the All Progressive Grand Alliance, for nomination as your candidate to lead your battle flag and fight to Ndimo for election to be made the next governor of Imo State on the year 2020. Reactions from members of the party bordered on the independence and reform of the judiciary as well as the effectiveness and the efficiency of the local government system in the state. In the entire Igbo land, it has been found that Abga is the party of our people. Party Ndibo. That in Kabon Kanye. All Igbo men, women, children, old age and uh, old age pensioners and all now want the uh, entire Igbo land to come under one political party where they can speak with one voice and make their feelings and aspirations known to whoever is in charge at the federal level. So that at the point when we are able to come together in one voice and make our demands to the federal level, whoever is there, if it is Abga or any other political party, our demands and aspirations will not be trifled with. But uh, this is the man we are waiting for. We need a strong character, people who can challenge the impunity of the Nebuchadnezzar in Nemo State. We have a very bad governor, a very wicked governor, and haven't worked with him haven't been with him in APC, he is the strongest that can face squarely, squarely. 
significant factor that will determine the run-up to the 2019 global elections in Imo State is the issue of zoning, which most stakeholders in Oweri believe that it's time for Oweri Zone to produce the next governor of Imo State after 16 years of governance from Olu Zone. Today on Real Dimensions, we will provide you the insider's view on any major issue that happened in the week. We'll be focusing on the politics in Imo and its future at this journey for who takes the reins of power the government house begins. We talked with Mr. Uchonya Agocha in an interview that I'll bring you now. Like we said, we have Honorable Uche Onya Agocha. He was a former member of um, the House of Representatives and presently an Abgaguba aspirant. Well, welcome to the program, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, so we want to know what brought you into this race for governorship in your state. When I decided to run for the governorship seat of Imo State, more particularly because of the mess that Governor Delba Dukroch has made out of governance in Imo State, he has denied pensioners their right, he has refused to pay workers their due, he has impoverished artisans and their KK operators. He has impoverished traders and destroyed their markets. Most of them actually decided to move to their rural areas after the big markets in the world were all destroyed, only for him to follow up in the rural areas after they destroyed the rural markets, after he destroyed the Kubo world. And these days when you listen to him, the only idea going on in his mind is how to make his son-in-law the next governor of Imo State. And all that is simply because he is looking for someone to cover him up. And he knows he's a candidate for EFCC detention. Therefore, in order to save himself and his son-in-law, he decided he must put him in power by every means necessary so as to secure him immunity after himself Rogers would have left the government. Looking at all of this, he has turned into a bloody dictator. He become very brutal. He boasts of how much he can use so much money uh, to bully and intimidate everybody and openly talks about if this person brings a, a, a car full of money, he will bring a dog full of money. Rogers actually has messed up governance in Nemo State to the extent that you can't even have pipe on water in Nemo State any longer. Wherever you see water today, it's from people's personal bowls. Our governor travels all over the world with pride in the public private jets. Who is being paid the bill? Our governor claims he has started an airline called Evo Airline. And this airline does not exist. It only exists by way of a write up on all that aircrafts. So when you look at this level of mess, the big question is who can go stop this? So 
look at the bridges constructed by the Ghana private government on the on nature of car in the West Expressway. Compare that to what uh, he is building. Look at the bridges he is building. It is only after he has completed the building of the uh, bridges, flyovers, that he now decided that he should put some pillars in between to make it strong. Whoever does that kind of construction. So even the Nigerian society of engineers has condemned.
were going to attract them to the state to begin to build these industries in order to show that we can produce things in our state and export to other areas since we have uh, the map power here in large number. To that extent, we are going to reach out to Imo and the Igbo people who are living outside of Imo State. Whatever businesses you have, we want to provide the enabling environment for you to come and set it up here. We are not asking you to close down the one you have outside the country. But if you choose to close it down and set up a better opportunity here, you're welcome. But we will provide an atmosphere that will make it attractive for our people to bring all their industries here. Because it is easier to attract an indigenous person to come and set up businesses here, which will create opportunity of jobs for artisans and people who are not who are differently qualified in, in uh, many other fields in, in the construction industry. We also have a good opportunity in agriculture because we have fertile land that can grow crops in different areas. So we are not going to allow a situation where, like you have in the present administration, Adapam has been totally destroyed, which is the simple, single biggest industry in Imo State. I will resuscitate Adapam, knowing that the palm fruits are there and waiting for good management. We will resuscitate it and we'll bring private hands to join up with us to grow businesses for the purpose of creating jobs. That is going to be our primary policy trust. But finally, and not uh, the least, we will make our education free, qualitative, and compulsory. How do you hope to achieve that? Well, I believe with the population of people you said uh, nobody should be allowed to keep any child of school age out of school. So how do you how do you hope to if we are going to cause education? Uh, oh, looking at the resources in the country. No, it's by investing in education and by in inviting a private sector to also come and invest in education, knowing that our people have a voracious appetite for education. The number of children of Imo State origin studying outside of Imo State. The amount of money they spend in a year as school fees will not be anything less than 25 billion. We need to attract at least 60% of that back home by setting up these schools and by encouraging private sector people to take advantage of this opportunity. Because every Imo person, just like most Imo people, will spend good money to give their children very good education. Okay, finally, let's look at the national, the national scene. Um, what will be your stand on the recent call by most stakeholders on restructuring? Do you believe that restructuring will solve the challenge, both economic and political challenge of the country? I agree with the call for restructuring. I will support the call for restructuring, and I will play with. In I will play with other groups to ensure that we achieve restructuring as a minimum. Today, there is no doubt about it that a lot of the responsibilities which the federal government is hanging on to, they have no reason holding it. Why should the federal government be involved in owning a secondary school like the unity schools? Why should the federal government be in charge of doing uh, our uh, 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 federal roads? This thing should be handed over to the state government. Why should the federal government be involved in owning uh, hospitals? This thing should be transferred to the states. So we are going to have to push to ensure that every responsibility which the federal government does not have need to be involved in, they must yield it to the states so that the states will have more resource and be able to take care of the interests of their people better. There is no way the federal government can be interested in education in Imo State more than the Imo State government. There is no way they can be interested in health care more than the Imo State government. There is no way they can be interested in fixing our roads more than ourselves. So I believe we should do. Uh, we should be in a position to have the federal government yield all these responsibilities 
when you look at the revenue sharing formula, the percentage that accrues to the federal government is too much. And that is why there is unnecessary conflict at the federal level. We are going to push for the federal government to cut down on its revenue share and have more of that shifted to the state government so that they can do something better, considering that they are nearer to the people. Thank you, Honorable Chagunja, for, for expressing your views on the future of people's states. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, we'll join the studio team for the rest of the program. That was Mr. Ocha Onya Agocha, an Abga stakeholder in Amos State, sharing his views on the politics of that state and on some national issues. We move on now to the national scene where the plans to dislodge Chief John Odige Oyego Tikins with the National Executive Council of the All Progressive Congress, APC, turned sore and heated after President Muhammad Buhari took a sharp tone and recanted on his support for eternal elongation for the leadership of the party. Just one month ago, President Buhari presided over the next meeting that approved a one-year extension for Chief Oyegun and his compatriots beyond their stay, which was supposed to end later in the second quarter of the year. However, in a swift, swift twist, President Buhari at the party's neck meeting during the week recounted urging the party to obtain decision calling the extension illegal and posing an illegality challenge to the decisions to be made by the executive. The president's call immediately unsettled the party, causing serious divisions between its ranks and file, which also led to inconclusiveness of the party's neck and its outcome unknown. The next few weeks will greatly determine the future of the party. The saying, thank God is Friday, which has been popularized among Nigerians, may not be far from the mouth, may be far from the mouth of the members of the People's Democratic Party and their arch rivals, the Rural All Progressive Congress, after the federal government on Friday released a list of those who it termed the looters of the Nigerian economy under Dr. Goodluck Jonathan's administration. The list is dominated by members of the PDP. Top on the list is the national chairman of the People's Democratic Party, Prince Uche Sokondos. Others included former National Public Secretary of the PDP, Olisa Metu, who is still facing trial, Dark Communications boss, Raymond Dobesi, and some others. Information Minister Lai Mohamed read out the list, which contains six names. Secondos accused of taking 200 million naira from the Office of the National Security Advisor on February 19, 2015, with Dudafa Warempo away, a former aide to President Goodluck Jonathan, who is listed as being on trial for allegedly keeping over 830 million in accounts of four different companies. The former president's cousin Robert Azibola, who is facing trial following a federal high court ruling that he has a case to answer for allegedly collecting $40 million from the uh, National Security Advisor. The PDP had, repri had replied calling the federal government to be in hate and vengeful while recalling that most members of the APC were members of the PDP while Prince Secundus has threatened to sue the federal government. We now move to another voice that trended within the week. Taraba is a mini state. It's a mini Nigeria composed of various ethnic groups living together reasonably peacefully. But the peace in this state is being is under assault. There is an attempt at ethnic cleansing in this state and of course in all the riverine state of Nigeria. We must resist it. We must stop it. Every one of us must rise up. The armed forces are not neutral. They collude. They collude. They collude with the armed bandits that kill people, kill Nigerians. 
they facilitate their movement. They cover them. If you are depending on the armed forces to stop the killings, you will all die one by one. The ethnic cleansing must stop in Taraba State, it must stop in all the states of Nigeria. Otherwise, Somalia will be a child's play. I ask every one of you to be alert and defend your country, defend your territory, defend your state. You have nowhere else to go. You have nowhere else to go. God bless our country. That was certainly tough and probably extreme. It is no longer news that the People's Democratic Party PDP has apologized for its sins and misrule of Nigeria. The national chairman of the party, Mr. Tuche Secundus, had in a public function in the week apologized to Nigerians for what it called impunity and imposition for which he said Nigerians punished them in 2015. It is commendable and honorable to say the least for the PDP to take this step a move which showed they recognized their roles in entrenching poverty and instituting the dirt of public infrastructure. But one thing that raises the concern is that this is coming just a few months before the election, something that makes it more of a political move than out of sincerity. Emphatically, the national chairman, Prince Secundus, who took the mandate of apologizing, is a beneficiary of the imposition of candidates. At least, the National Convention of the party where he emerged as chairman still failed the integrity and internal democracy test. Most of his opponents stepped down for manipulation of the process. In fact, major elders of the party and some serving members of the party's board of trustees had to leave the party and join the smaller social democratic party. If a party that has not been able to address the issues of internal democracy up to the time of the apology may not be trusted with the national resources. However, the party's national chairman promised Nigerians the, that it will carry out sweeping reforms where power will be vested at the smaller units of, of the party, the world's local government, and state branches. Maybe this reform will bring a lease of life, or maybe it will be a case of repenting the sports of a leopard. With that editorial, we come to the end of this edition of the program, The Week in Review. We hope you had a nice time with us. I am still your presenter, David Abokasila, and on behalf of the team here, we say thank you for staying back and listening. Photo of the Week comes up next. As you remember, that on top of the hour at 7, the news comes your way. I am David Abokasila again. Thank you for staying back.